You know, lately I've been thinking, in the past two years, I've added quite a few knives to my collection. I've gone from one when I was 16, now I'm almost 35, I have 22 plus knives. And I don't want to continue growing that collection indefinitely, especially because the value that I say my collection has is, they all have purpose. I use them all. Sure, there's a few duplicates like this Santoku, there's a few Gyoto duplicates, um, but if I really have to think hard about what knife would I sell? You know, what knife could maybe make someone happier than I if I'm not going to be using it? I start to think about this Fujiwara Maboroshi Santoku, white steel number one, and I thought, it's such a solid performer. But ever since I got the River Jump, I just don't really use it because the price point of the River Jump at about $1,400 Canadian, I thought, I might as well use that knife. And so though I don't really want to sell this knife, I'm thinking maybe I will eventually, but if I will, there's a few things that I need to fix. So the first thing is on this beautiful curly maple blue handle, the bolster cracked a few years ago because of how dry it was in Edmonton. Put a bit of epoxy to fix it. Second thing I'd like to fix is this was one of the first knives that I used on a whetstone. And so you can see there's some learning curves right here, right? That I really affected the polish. I went too tight of an angle. And so I'd like to learn how to fix this. And then lastly, the spine isn't exactly the most comfortable to hold. It's definitely not uh, kotetsu type polish. And so I think that's what I want to do. I want to work on the spine. I want to polish it. I want to fix the look on the tip of the blade and the handle. I think I'm actually going to replace for this handle, which was the original handle on the river jump until I put one of Dustin's handles from Real Sharp Knife. And it's, therefore, I think it's gonna look really classy, right? We're gonna have this beautiful Santoku with Tsuchimi hand hammered finish. We're gonna have the classic Magnolia handle. So it'll look something like this. I'm gonna fix the um, scuff that I added to the blade as well as polish the spine. And so if I decide to sell it, it's gonna be fantastic. I'm gonna have given it life again. And if I don't choose to sell it, I'm still gonna give it new life, but it'll be my knife. So stay tuned, who knows? I'll show you the finished product. We'll see when I get her done, but I think that's what I'm going to do. As much as it pains me to remove this handle because I love the dyed blue wavy maple, I'll probably just keep the handle, but the bolster needs to go. And if the bolster needs to go, it all needs to go. Why shouldn't you do this at home? It's because the tool I'm using, though harder than wood, is shorter than the length of the blade, which means I risk hitting the blade before I hit the tool, and that's exactly what happened later on when I knocked the tip right off. I'm pretty hard-headed. My attempt now is no different than attempt two. I've been told that if it's epoxy in the handle, which it is and was confirmed by the handle maker, then I'm gonna have to chisel it off. So this is me just being hard-headed and smacking away.
Well, 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 we have a bit of a fun day. We're sous vidding something new for the first time and it's a knife whose handle I'm trying to remove. There's epoxy on it, nothing seems to work. So trying this before I get to the chisel. Yeah, so clearly sous vidding didn't work. I did get to crack the bolster a bit, which was oddly satisfying. Less satisfying was missing the tool I was using to try to remove the handle and knock the tip right off. So I tried sous vide 150 degrees Fahrenheit for one hour, didn't work. Got the chisel, someone told me to try sous vide 200 degrees Fahrenheit for 10 minutes. I was about to do that, but I just want to try with the chisel real quick. Tried with the chisel real quick and it's amazing. So I actually want to try to preserve this bit of the handle just for fun. So I'm going, it's raining outside now, so I'm actually not going to chisel the rest of this. I'm going to try the sous vide bed now, 200 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 minutes. Hopefully this slides off and uh, I'll preserve uh, the bottom half if possible for who knows what. Oh, also I bought a big hammer, isn't that cool? Trying again, this time 197 degrees instead of 200, because apparently that's the max. It's still going up, but I'll leave it for about 10 minutes. No, my friends, what you are seeing is not the result of the sous vide being successful. It was the chisel. The chisel all along, like everyone told me, when there's epoxy in the handle, just use the chisel. And it took under two minutes. Of course, I destroyed the bolster and the handle is cracked in half, so the handle is not recuperable, but lesson learned. Next time there's epoxy, I might give it a try, just dry wood, not boiling it, but otherwise it's probably gonna have to be the chisel. All right, everyone, so welcome back. What you just saw me do was using numerous attempts to remove the handle that used to be on this Fujiwara, and now there is no handle, so I was successful. For those of you who have removed handles very often, you probably got frustrated thinking there was an easier way to do that, and I do know that. Now, of course, I always start with the hammer and piece of wood. Typically, if it works, that's where it's gonna work best. If it works afterwards, or sorry, I should say, if it doesn't work, then one needs to start looking at well, what's the compound holding the handle together? Most people told me to just use a chisel if it was epoxy. I did get confirmation that it was epoxy, but really most of this is about a learning experience and I have nothing to lose except time. But time is life. And to me, having that time, giving myself the appreciation of the techniques, learning from those mistakes, that's now a piece of knowledge that I have from learned experience. And that's something that you can't just get by having someone else tell you what you should do if they don't know the full context of the situation. So I'm happy I tried all those attempts, but yes, in the end, the handle that was affixed to this knife was glued using epoxy and nothing worked except the chisel. As you can see, the handle, which I wanted to keep in one piece, didn't really work out that way. Uh, of course, it's cracked. I'm still gonna keep this just because, uh, I don't know, nice little piece of memory. So the handle is off. The handle that will be put on at another point in time is going to be this one, which was on the river jump. And next up. Now, prior to having a tip which was broken caused by myself, what I did do is I also wanted to round and polish the spine. Now, Fujiwara's, uh, especially, actually pretty much all the lines, they're well known for not having the best fit and finish. Uh, it's not going to be a Lakotetsu nice rounded spine, but that's what you see here. And what I used was 320 grit paper. Now, some people, again, had told me to use lower grit paper, but again, I'm a proponent of making sure that I have some type of tool kit. I might not always have the best tools, but if I have something, then I can get by. It's kind of the same way I cook. I open the fridge, and though I might have a set idea of what I want to cook, a pasta dish, I'm going to use what's in the fridge. And so same thing, to have some tools is better than having none because it's then like having no ingredients and not being able to make your own dish. And so I may do with what I had by with the 320 grit sandpaper. It just meant I had to put a little bit more elbow grease into it. But in the end, it worked out really well. I wasn't going for anything that was too aggressive. I just wanted to really give comfort to that spine when holding it with the pinch grip. Same thing with the choil. Uh, of course, then I knocked off the tip, fixed the tip, and so I'll be re-rounding that and polishing it a little bit, but essentially that's what this looks like. Now the method that I used in polishing the spine, this was a method that was shared to me by someone on the Japanese knife Facebook group, was essentially to take the sandpaper and not use it on the knife, but use the knife on the sandpaper. So what I mean by that is I took the sandpaper, I put some double-sided tape, I put it straight on the kitchen counter and then I used the blade and guided it this way. That way it made it a lot easier for me to be able to choose the angle. 
All right, so the goal here is we'll be using the Atoma 140 plate to grind off a lot of material off the spine of the Santoku and have it round and make a new point. And to do that, I'm going to draw a line with a permanent marker. And that line is going to represent the steel that we want to remove with the Atoma. Maybe something like that. I want to make sure that I can keep a bit of a pointy tip because otherwise it'll remind me of cheap Santokus that always have tips that are so rounded that you have no use from the tips. So maybe we'll aim to do something like this. So we're going to remove everything that's black sharpie. Now the goal here is going to be to remove the black sharpie. The black sharpie signifies the steel that I decided I want to remove in order to make a new knife tip. At first I'm going to take it slow, it's my first time, I'm a little bit nervous, so I'm only going to be stroking the knife backwards. Eventually you'll see me gain confidence and I'll move it front and back almost in a sharpening motion. For those curious, the whole process took me about 35 minutes, again initially taking it slow after every few strokes having a look to see how much material I removed. I was also wary of pushing it forward because if I pushed it at the wrong angle, there was the possibility of the tip dipping back into the stone and chipping it yet again. Just slightening up on the pressure since we're getting to the end. Not sure if I'll remove all of this permanent marker, but we've done an excellent job of creating a new tip. Especially for a first time, so this is using an Atoma 140 stone. Splashing it here and there when we can tell it was getting dry. And the biggest point of guidance was really that permanent marker that allowed me to visually see on one side how close I was getting to the objective and to see on the other side the realization that we just created a new tip. There's one more skill in the knife knowledge knife bag. Now of course we'll want to polish this. The spine isn't as rugged as I thought it would be, especially using an Atoma 140 stone. Um, are we satisfied with the tip? We can probably refine it just a little bit more. I'm working on this now for about 30 minutes, a little more. I'm going to do some refining touches and I'll show you guys the final product. Just a few light final strokes now that we've created a new tip. Let me show you what that tip looks like. Here's the other side. We were able to maintain nice 
acute this to the spine. I didn't want it to be too round like this because then the tip becomes useless. So we have a nice sharp tip. And so the step we're at now, now that we've removed the handle, now that we've fixed the tip, now that we've polished the spine, well now what we're going to do is we're going to remove these bite marks. I call them bite marks, you might call them scuff marks, whatever you want. Essentially when I got whetstones uh, quite a few years ago and I was learning how to sharpen on whetstones, because there is a learning curve, when the angle became too shallow, when I didn't respect the angle of that primary bevel, what that means is I'm going to get the secondary bevel and anything above that scratched up and that's exactly what happened here i never removed that at the time because it didn't bother me but i figured you know what if i'm going to be doing a santoku makeover it's about time that i fix all the little things and this is going to be one of those little things so the method i'm going to employ again thanks to all the super generous members on the japanese knife group on facebook i'll put the link to that group below if ever you want to join. I'll work my way up the grid from an Tomo 140, then I'll use a Shapton Glass 500 stone, a 1000, and maybe end on the 6000. We'll see how it goes, but the goal in the end is to flatten this, thin it ever so slightly, though it's, it's a really thin blade to begin with, and most importantly, remove those scuff marks. So just to show you some of the tools I'll be using to flatten and thin, as mentioned, I'll have, of course, this stone holder, maybe even two. Here's the Atoma 140 plate. And then I will be going through my assortment of Shapton glass from 500 to 1000 to 6000 with the goal of removing those scuff marks and flattening the topography along the blade. All right, here we go. No holding back. We're going to be getting rid of these scuff marks by counterintuitively adding more scratches to the blade from lower grits to high grit until everything's gone, until we remove the lows, until we flatten and thin a bit. Let's see what happens. All right, here we go. Nervous is off. So I don't want to go, I don't want to be clicking down, pushing down on the primary bevel. We want to try to keep it flat. Oh no, Frankie, what are you doing? Guys, I'm so sorry for you knife polishers and knife thinners out there. I'm doing exactly the opposite of what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> I don't know if it was the nerves, the but scratches. I'm about to scratch up the Hira. So, really so above the bevel, again, the opposite. I'm gonna make you watch the rest of this because these are lessons learned. But everyone watching this, this is what you're not supposed to do. This is not thinning. I'm just scratching up the polish. So clearly since you can see the scratch marks here, what that also means is uh, these are high spots. Yeah, of course they're high spots. It's a Tsuchimi pattern, idiot. I shouldn't be doing any of this. And we're gonna do this until we have scratch marks along the entire plane of this side of the blade before we flip to the next side. All right, I can't watch this anymore. I'm sure most of you can't either. I'm just gonna stop this here. I'll show you what the ruined hero looks like and let's get to some real thinning. Alright, so we're done on one side with the Atoma 140. What I'm now showing you is the side that hasn't been touched with the Atoma. So that's the OG side. And on the other side, I made a big mistake, but it's okay, we'll fix it. And so I thought thinning, as you can see already with the Tsuchimi pattern, I thought, I thought thinning meant uh, working on the Hira. But no, it means working on the bevel. So on the Hira, as you can see, I removed a lot of the Tsuchimi finish, which is gonna end up with a very particular look that probably other Maburoshi Santokus don't have. But then I fixed my mistake by actually flattening and thinning the bevel, which you can see here. Now surprisingly, for a blade that's been flattened, thinned, added a new tip to it, it's still actually really sharp. Here's a paper. All 
All right, so it's 11 p.m. I don't even want to tell you how long that took, but point is you can figure it out. 11 p.m. I'm just about to have dinner. This is the side I quote unquote screwed up because the word thinning is misleading. More about that when I work on a sharpening video. I'm not a fan of that word and you'll know why. So I removed most of the tsuchimi finish by accident and then actually worked the bevel, which is what thinning should be. And now here's the other side which is how it should look like from the start. So there you go, oops. You can see thin from the edge all the way to that Shinobi line, all the way down. There's a little low spot there and all the way to the tip. What's up? So here's the thing, it's not that I'm trying to be sneaky, but had I not told you what the next zone was gonna be, you would have assumed based on what I said earlier that I would have moved on from the Atoma 140 to the Shafting Glass 500. But a good friend of mine, Andrew Bishop, also a Takeda knife lover extraordinaire, got on his bike by 25 minutes in my neighborhood, thankfully we're in the same city, and dropped off two more stones because he said, since I put some really deep striations into the steel with the Atoma 140, it's a really rough grit, that I should move up progressively and that an Atoma 140 to a Shafting Glass 500 would be too big a jump. And so he lent me the Shafting Glass 120, which I'm moving on to next, followed by the Shafting Glass 220, and only then will I then move on to the Shafting Glass 500, which is mine, followed by the 1000. We'll see if we really need the 6000, and we'll see even more if we need the Japanese natural stone. Enjoy. 